one this morning.
something inside of me knows there is surely more than this echoes of eternity all around us we know this was a few weeks ago sing it with me God, we can sing of your great grace. We can sing that we can worship you with everything that we have because you are a worthy God. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, God. Your scripture declares is here right now. So we pray the Holy Spirit will just increase, increase more and more, God. The presence will grow. We can worship you because our chains are gone and we have been set free. And 
You are a good God. You break the chains of this world that Satan thinks are a strong tool, God, but nothing is strong compared to your might. So, God, continue to break chains as we worship. If we shake the chains off, God, they would be gone. They would never come back. We can worship you. This beating heart will sing a song for you, for you are good, and you are good forever. Amen. I just want to welcome everyone this morning. I want to welcome you to Central Baptist Church. For all our first and second time guests, in the back of your bulletin, there is a guest information sheet. If you don't have one, look around. I'm sure one of our members has one for you. But in the back of it, you can take it just a second and fill it out for us. Just have some information. We want to get your contact information, your name. We just want to invest in you and show you that this is our home. We want to show you around and be good hosts for you. And then the service, you can take that um, guest information sheet and take it back to our welcome booth in the foyer. And we'll have a little gift for you. So go around right now. Find some people. Find someone you know. Shake their hands. Hey, guys. This is Peyton Neal, worship pastor at Central Baptist Church in Tyler. Check us out Sunday mornings at 945 for our small group Bible studies, as well as our 1045 worship service. If you need more information, feel free to visit us at www.centraltyler.org, or if you need more information, just check out the number below. Thank you for watching the video of our service today. We would love to see you here soon. Let's have Brother Beckman come forward as he leads us in our opportunity to give. Amen. You know it's going to be a good day when there's a banjo and a harmonica. Amen. I like that. I like that. All right. Welcome to Central Baptist. We're so glad you came. Uh, it is an exciting today to be in the house of the Lord. I just love this time of year as we, you know, this cool fall weather. Isn't it just wonderful? Well, it's coming. It's coming. Trust me. It's coming. It'll be here soon. We do want to challenge you uh, about a giving opportunity. It's always a privilege to get to be a part of God's kingdom work. And part of it is the worship in song, part of it is worship in the word, and part of it is worship in giving. Because of your faithful giving, we are able to do so many things around here. And one of the things we're able to do is support missionaries around the world. We just got back from spending 10 days in Scotland and we're able to keep them in the UK. That's only for you that watch the news. If you don't watch the news, if you were busy on Nick at Night, you didn't see that. But there was a big boat in Scotland. Anyway, they stayed in it. But anyway, we had a great time in the UK. And one of the privileges of being there was seeing our missionaries. And that's why we went. And one of the missionary families we were privileged to see was Rick and Sherry Moeller. They're missionaries to Scotland. And they have a son, Matt, and his wife, Erica. Moeller headed to Scotland as well. So, Matt, would you come on up here? I'm going to have him pray for us. They're also missionaries to Scotland. Would you give them a welcome? And I'm glad that they're at Central Baptist. I'll let him pray for the offering here So, in just a moment. But uh, thank you for your giving. We are, as we get ready to move forward in this service, they're going to pass the offering plates. If you haven't already had a chance to give, please take advantage of it. And know that some of your giving makes possible sending out great families like this to plant churches all over the world. Matt, would you lead us in prayer, please? Father, thank you for your love and for your mercy, God. Thank you for this church and the uh, the difference they're making for you, uh, not only in their community, but in their world, God. I, I pray that you'd continue uh, to bless them for that, Lord. I, I pray that you'd just be at work uh, this morning in this service and in the, in the songs of, of praise that are sang to you and in the message uh, that, that you've given as well, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. I just pray that hearts would be soft today, Lord, that we would just feel you moving, God. You know that wherever God's placed you, that that's where your mission field is. I want God to get the glory out of everything that I do. It's like I want them to see God. I pray that those who don't know you in our school, that, Father, we would be a light to them. Father, we would go out into the school and and we would show them, we would show them what a Christian is supposed to be like. We are here to spread God's word and his love. That's why he put us here. Let us magnify you and let us magnify your light. As we let him pour into our lives, he's going to overflow into others. People need to see a hope and just people circled around a flagpole praying to God. We want you to be our greatest desire. Let our hearts be the proof of your love, God. Now, be praying for our young adults, our students this Wednesday morning. We're going to have a seeing with all their schools, and it's a really great opportunity.
not for them to grow as leaders, but to influence others around them, to see students and young people come to know Jesus Christ. And that's what our mission is. So be praying for all the students around. We represent a lot of schools this Wednesday morning. I believe in the virgin birth. 
Bloodshed in our eyes, God, so undeserving, but so much love in your eyes. Even on the cross, you looked out at people throwing dice for your clothes, God, and you just asked the Father to forgive them. And that's the type of love that you show. You're just full of love and grace, even at your final breath. You're full of love and grace. And that's the freedom we can stand for in this room. That's the freedom that is found here in the name of Jesus Christ, through you alone, through no other God, through no other person, God, and not even ourselves. It's freedom you alone. For you are the God of the universe and you are worthy. You are a mighty God that brings justice. And you will come again to judge the living and the dead. For we believe in you. So show your mind. Show your power. We thank you for the cross. We love you for the cross. The hearts that we have, God, they will live for you and march to your rhythm. Break our chains, Jesus. Break the chains. It's all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone said, Amen. You can be seated. Thank God for the cross. Amen. Turn in your Bibles, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to be reading about eight verses there. I'll read aloud if you'll follow along with me. How many of you brought a Bible with me today? You bring a Bible with you? You got a Bible? Good, good. How many got it on your iPhone? Let's see. All right, please silence your phone. And if you have an iPad or Android or Galaxy or whatever it is, but we're glad you're here and we want you to look into the Word of God with us. We're talking about chains, breaking free, breaking the chains that are holding us back. 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 3. 2 Timothy, I don't get the right book. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. That's where I want to be. It starts with, I thank God, all right? We found it? All right, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did as without ceasing. I remember you in my prayers night and day. Greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy. This is Apostle Paul writing to his young protege, Timothy, who he has left behind at Ephesus to continue the work. They've, they've started and had an incredibly successful church in Ephesus, and God has moved Paul on to his next mission station, and he's left behind Timothy. So he's talking to Timothy, and he's talking about his love he has for him. Verse 5, he says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. 
Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of his save, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed an, a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also, also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. A wonderful passage. The key of it for this morning's message is in verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So if you are gripped by fear today, it's not coming from God. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And yet I find so many people are gripped by fear. And in order to get rid of the chains that are holding us back, we have to break the chains of fear. I looked up on a website on the internet to find out some information about fear, and I found the list of the top 10 phobias, the top 10 fears that people have. And I just noticed that when I was doing this that I, uh, I experienced almost all of these on my recent trip to the United Kingdom. <laughs> the only thing I didn't run across was arachnophobia, the fear of spiders. They didn't see a spider the whole time, so that was good. But the number 10 fear that people have is the fear of thunder and lightning. Any of you all afraid of thunder and lightning? We want to know so we can run up behind you and clap our hands. Are you afraid of thunder and lightning? Some are afraid. Number nine is open spaces, agoraphobia. I had a lot of that traveling across the country. Fear of confined spaces. That's claustrophobia. I had some of that in airplanes. Fear of flying, <laughs> aerophobia. Fear of people or social situations, that's me. Yeah, I know. Social phobia, not a social path. Social phobia, that means you're afraid of being in social settings. Fear of heights, acrophobia. We went up on something called the Eye of London. It's 30 stories tall. It's this huge Ferris wheel that goes around and it moves very slow. It takes 30 minutes for it to go around, and you're in this big uh, pod with windows all around it. And it looks very, it looks very stout and secure. I mean, I was checking it out. Thing about, <laughs> thing about it is, my wife is very much afraid of heights, and so I was saying, "We got to do this. We got to do this," because you know, I know she would hate it. And I'm going to tell you, I was scared to death the whole time I was in that thing. My knees were shaking. I didn't. I walked around. I walked around like nobody would know. Stood over by the window. But sometimes I'd start to take a step and my leg wouldn't move. You know, it's like, <laughs> you ever had that fear of heights where you're just not working? It, aerophobia. Uh, acrophobia, excuse me. Fear of darkness. Achuculophobia or so, scotophobia or micro. It's got lots of different names. Scared of the dark. Anybody here afraid of the dark? Turn the lights off. Let's see. No. Arachnophobia, fear of spiders. Anybody afraid of spiders? I just think that's hilarious. Uh, people are afraid of spiders. My wife's not afraid of spiders. She's afraid of snakes. But she's not afraid of spiders. She will kill any snake-like looking creature. It could be a worm, but she'll kill it because it looks like a snake. I'm picking on Barbara today. But a spider, she wants to save it. She found a spider in the house, she said, take it outside and let it live. Why? Some, some of those things bite, you know. I'm not afraid of them, but they bite. I don't want them in the house. But anyway, you afraid of spiders? Or Spider-Man? No, <laughs> spider Fear of death. That's a pretty strong fear. That's the number two fear. Necrophobia. We're afraid of death. And that one makes sense. And the last one is, amazingly, the number one fear. Do you know what it is? It's glossophobia. It's the fear of public speaking. 
I, anybody here afraid to speak publicly? Raise your hand. Okay, come on up here. <laughs> Actually, I don't get that one. I, never, I bypassed that one. But those are the top ten phobias. People are afraid. They're afraid all the time. But that what was more interesting than what were the top ten phobias were worry statistics, and they had done the statistical analysis. I don't know how they did it, but it said the percent of things feared that will never take place, 60%. That means over half the things you're afraid of most of the time will never take place. Percent of things feared that will happen, that happened in the past and can't be changed, that's 30%. In other words, you're still afraid of something that happened a long time ago and you can't change it anyway. So that's a waste of fear. It's a done deal. Percent of things feared that are considered to be insignificant issues in life. I guess that's all about who's making this chart up, but 90%. People are afraid of things that are basically insignificant in the, in the course of events. I was uh, watching somebody the other day doing a newscast, and they had had a, an airplane frightening thing, and they had to land the plane emergency, and they thought they were going to die, and this guy got off the plane, and he's just saying, just puts into contrast what, what, you know, how precious life is and how little we need to be worried about some of the things I was worried about before I got on that plane. And I thought, Amen. We worry about all kinds of things. We're afraid of things that are basically insignificant. And this statistic, percent of things feared in relation to health that will not happen, 88%. So go ahead and eat the bacon and eggs and bypass the brand muffin. No, I shouldn't be giving you that advice, should I? But a lot of things we worry about health-wise that are never going to happen. They're just not going to happen. But here's one I thought that was pretty interesting. The number of Americans who have a diagnosed phobia, and this is, I'm joking about this, but this is serious stuff. This really hinders people's life. 6.3 million have a diagnosed phobia. That's, the, that's just the ones who went and paid the money to have the guy say, or the gal say, you, you got a problem. But the, there's a whole lot of people with phobias. But I'm not really talking about necessarily the kind of overblown fears that totally uh, paralyze us, but we all suffer with fear. In different kinds. Let me ask you, when was the last time you were afraid? Sometimes, if you think about it, you might not be able to identify it intellectually as much as you can identify what it felt like. The clenching of your stomach, the panic, the anxiety, the sweat on your brow. I found that often fears attack us in the night. Have you ever been attacked by fear in the night? Wanting to have a good night's sleep, and bang, here it comes. Overblown thoughts of some perceived danger to your goals, your reputation, your finances, or your relationships, and suddenly your peace is gone, and you're left sweating and twisting. I asked somebody the other day, I was, sent, I was trying to get a grip on this sermon, and I asked one of the office staff, I said, well, you know, tell me about fear, and she said, fear is the devil. <laughs> And I thought, that's funny. Fear is the devil. But it, you know what? I, the more I thought about it, there's a lot of truth in that. Fear is the devil, or at least fear is one of the major tools of the devil. Because it has an ability to paralyze us in our lives. When we feel fear, we stop trying, we stop reaching out, we stop dreaming, we start hiding. Fear is some combination of the enemy's attack Satan's attack, which is usually centered around some recent sin that he informs us has robbed us of God's blessing or our own imagination running wild while we toss and turn in the sheets. Have you ever been attacked by fear in the night? What do you do? I found that it helps to get up and exchange worry for prayer, to exchange scriptural promises for satanic accusations, and to exchange memories of God's deliverance for my worries. But everyone is afraid. Today, you may not be afraid at the moment, but all of us feel fear at some time. But people who get on in life and get on in their Christian goals are people who learn to take action in spite of the fear. You have to get learn that it's okay to be afraid, but you have to do it anyway. It's okay to be afraid of the I the London Eye, but you got to get on it anyway. you got to make your legs walk and get on the thing and do it anyway. 
And here in our text, Paul was writing to inspire a young preacher of the gospel, and he was facing challenges in Ephesus. Timothy would be battling heresies and infections that were attacking the church, and he was a young man. And if you've ever been called to a ministry in the Lord's church, you understand some of the fear that was probably in his heart. And Paul wrote to him and he said, listen, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. Timothy, don't be afraid. Don't let the enemy fill you with fear. I have found that many Christians are limiting themselves in their service for God out of fear. We can talk about the phobias of claustrophobia and heights and different things, and that's all funny. But when fears are stopping Christian people from doing ministry, we need to take action against those fears. I found that there are Christians who are afraid to share their faith with others. I found there are Christians who are afraid to trust the Lord with their material possessions. I have found Christians who are afraid to commit to a complete obedience in their life because they fear what it might cost them, and others that are afraid to take on leadership roles and kingdom work because of fear of failure or success. These are fears that are holding us back. These are fears that are limiting your ministry. These are fears that are impacting your family, and these are fears that are impacting the work of this church. So, in this passage, Paul addresses some of these fears, and I want to just take a few moments to look at it. First of all, I think he addresses the fear of being a Christian. You know, some people are afraid to be a Christian. Perhaps you're here today and you've heard through the singing today or through a personal testimony, we were talking about the blood of Christ and how it cleanses from sin. We're talking about being made a new creature in Christ. And probably at some time in your life, you've heard people say that you need to accept Christ as your Savior and you need to become a Christian. And you've thought about it. You've considered it. Perhaps you've even gotten close to doing it. But fear has held you back. Fear has kept you from becoming a Christian. And for some people, it is the fear of being imperfect. They're fearful that they will not be able to live up to the demands of Christianity once they've committed themselves. One of my favorite writers is Frederick Beekner. And in his book, Alphabet of Grace, he reminds us of some of the frustration that if you're not a believer yet, you need to understand that every believer, sometimes or another, suffers with the frustration of not being a perfect Christian. And we have this fear of being imperfect, and yet the reality is every Christian is imperfect on some level in their Christian walk. Frederick Buechner said, I am a part-time novelist who also happens to be a part-time Christian because part of the time seems to be the most I can manage to live out my faith. I like the honesty of that. Christian in any sense that I believe matters much to Christ or anybody else. Now, you don't have to raise your hand. But I'm thinking by every believer in here knows what he's talking about. A part-time Christian. Because part of the time seems to be the only what manner that I can manage to live out my faith. Now, that does not mean they're not serious. It does not mean you're not committed. It does not mean you've had not had a genuine experience of being born again. But the reality is when we become a believer in Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residence there. But we still have a flesh. We still have this body. We're still in this world. And we still are going to struggle from time to time. And so we have this fear of being imperfect. We, we're fear of knowing the scrutiny of a cynical world, especially in the Facebook era and social media era where every flaw and every bad decision gets multiplied and plastered all over for everybody's information sheet. So we fear the scrutiny of a cynical world. We fear the dreaded label of hypocrite. And we fear wrestling with poor spiritual self-esteem that we feel like we have failed God. In 2 Timothy, look at verses 4 and 6, we see this encouragement to Timothy that he, not, he needs not fear this. He says, greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you. Paul is giving testimony to the genuine faith that is in Timothy. He's encouraging him. He said, you are not a perfect pastor. You're not a perfect Christian. But I'm going to tell you as your mentor in the faith and as a preacher of the gospel and apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, I recognize genuine faith in you. There's a genuine faith that dwells within you. He said, I started first with your grandmother Lois. So all the grandmothers give themselves a pat on the back. And then with your mother Eunice. So mothers give yourself a pat on the back. But the point is that he had a genuine faith. 
So we need to re- lean on the fact that we may be imperfect, but we can still have a genuine faith. When you look at your life and you're frustrated with yourself sometimes, don't l- dwell so much on your struggles, but dwell on the depth and the root of your faith. Dwell on the reality that there is something real there and something powerful there, something that changed you, something that moves you, and something that continues to compel you to seek God, a genuine faith. We also fear being labeled emotionally weak or intellectually shallow, at least some do. There's the teaching in this world that Christianity is just a crutch that weak people use to get them through the night. Science and philosophy sometimes declare our faith in God as childish in its reasoning. And culture pushes us to the sidelines along with the nuts and the quacks. And serious Christians are lumped with the violence of religious fanatics and terrorists, and that's not an easy pill to swallow. We like to be respected and admired in our community, and yet sometimes there was a time when religious leaders and religious, serious, devout Christians were much admired, but now we're often ridiculed in our culture. Here in verses 8 through 9, we have an encouragement over this fear. When he says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace that was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. How do you overcome this fear of being labeled intellect? Because something has happened to you and God has called you and God has filled you with a holy calling and that God has powered you through his Holy Spirit and he saved you and you're a unique child of God and you're something special in this world. Listen, don't be surprised that lost people don't understand you. Paul would write in another place that the wisdom of this world is foolishness, foolishness compared to Uh, The wisdom of God is foolishness compared to the wisdom of this world. But then he goes on to say that that the weak of Christ's world are mighty compared to the strong in this world. We we have power they don't understand. Listen, we walk in realms they don't get. And I've been doing it for about 40 years. I remember one time being in a situation where uh, a lawyer was trying to intimidate me and and trying to frighten me about... Uh, attacks they were going to make on the church. And he's, he's basically said, he had me nervous until he said, uh, you know, I, it'd be a shame to see Central Baptist Church just disappear and, and, and it just all that hard work go, to, go away. And I just, uh, that, 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 I was so glad he said that because when he said that, I just said, oh, you've gone too far now. Because I want to tell you something, you can pick on me all you want to, but when you start picking on the institution of the church, when you start picking on the bride of Christ, when you start picking on the one that Jesus died for, when you start picking on something that's been around 2,000 plus years and has weathered tyrants and storms and attacks and destruction, you are wasting your time. And you're just reminding me that you're a foolish person and there's power you don't even begin to understand. See, we have power they don't even begin to get. We have a holy calling. We have a Christ dwelling with us. They don't see that. They don't understand that. People will look at you and say, oh, you believe some crazy stuff about an ancient book? No, no, I'll tell you what I believe. I believe there's a power and a might in me because I've experienced the living God, and he lives in me and walks with me, and I know him, and he hears me when I pray, and you're in the presence of a child of God. Listen, we don't need to be intimidated by the teachings of this world because they're just, they change every day, but our truth is eternal. And then we have not only this kind of fear, but we have the fear of death. This is our most primal fear. We try to banish fate of death from our vision in this world. You know, uh, there was a time, and some of you are, remember it, where death was more in sight in our culture. People uh, got their lunch out of the barnyard, and they realized that that chicken didn't come saran wrapped and already cut up, right? Right? You remember? Do you know that? I don't want to upset you. I remember when we were, my, <laughs> Amanda, when we were, when she was a little girl, my, we were at my father-in-law's farm, and he, he always raised some cattle, and he always kept one or two for, for meat. And so we, we, we had been out there, and Amanda and girls had been feeding these calves and playing with these calves. And one day, we were eating steak one day for dinner, and they asked, where's Coco? 
and my father-in-law being just who he was said, well, you're eating him. <laughs> oh, that did not go over well with that little Amanda Jean. She did not like that. She said, I'm not eating cocoa. <laughs> I said, well, pass cocoa to me because <laughs> I will have some more cocoa right there. It's all right with me. But anyway, <laughs> but even then she said, I'm not eating any more beef. You know, I'm not eating any more beef. I'm just going to eat chickens because they don't get killed. <laughs> Well, she was five, you know. When he, you know five. He didn't have chickens, so he didn't, she didn't know. But when, when we lived on a farm, we understood more about the circle of reality that death is constant. Animals die, and so do we. People, people you know, there was a time when many people died in their own home. And it was very common. People were aware of death more. We, we try to push death away from us in our culture. We, we hide it away in certain places and make it as antiseptic as possible. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying it's, it's something that some people just don't want to, they deal with death by never wanting to face it. And they imply that it, it's not going to happen because they don't want to go. I, I'm not picking on people, but I've met people who have never been to a funeral in their adult life. I said, well, no, somebody, you, you've never known anybody to die? Oh, yeah, but I just don't go to funerals. Well, that's a nice privilege. But the reality is you're going to one. (laughs) You are. Yours. We're all going to die. It's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. We have to deal with the reality that death is here. And we have this primal fear of death. But thank God here in this text in verse 9 through 10, we find about this issue For who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death. Oh, underline that. Who has abolished death and brought life and immortality through light, through the gospel. Oh, that's something to get excited about. That's why we were singing about that cross. That's why hands were being lifted to the air. That's why smiles are creasing faces, because that death on the cross abolishes death for all who believe in him. We had a very trouble-free flight coming and going, but I have been on some flights that scared me. It's been a while, but I've been on a few. And, and, and honestly wondered for you know, a moment or two if we were going to crash those planes. Um, but it was okay. I mean, I wasn't eager to go through the experience, but I knew because I had accepted Christ as my Savior that he had abolished death in my life, and his life was in me, and I was an eternal being, and should I die on that plane, I would wake up in heaven. Of course, I was way blowing in it, just like the statistics out of I've learned to I've learned to realize that those planes can handle a whole lot more than I think they can. Amen? Isn't that right? Yeah, it's true, it's true. I don't I, some of our brave pilots. I don't know how you get on a plane every day and go everywhere you go. But, you know, it's just relax. Now, when I see the stewardess strapping herself in, I get a little nervous about that. But the rest of the time, you know, it's, it's just all right. But even if it's not all right, even if it's not all right, I know that I'm prepared for death. I'm not seeking death. I'm not morbid. I don't dislike life. I love my life. I hope I get to live to be 100 years old. But should death come tomorrow? I'm not afraid of it because death has been abolished for me in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why salvation is so precious because it abolishes death. We don't have to fear death. People who are, the number two fear of people is fear of death, not for believers. That's why one of my favorite scriptures to quote at the grave when we're standing there with people who are laying the loved one to rest is Paul's promise there. In 1 Thessalonians 4, when he says, We sorrow not as those who have no hope, because we know we will see them again. Death is not the end. Death is only the door that we pass through on the way to life eternal, and we will see our loved ones again. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Aren't you glad you know the Lord? The last fear I want to focus on here in this passage is the fear of loss. Some people reject service for God and reject commitment to God out of fear that their life will be wasted. When I surrendered my life to preach the gospel, my girlfriend at the time uh, 
broke up with me because she said, I'm not going to waste my life as a preacher's wife. You know, uh, a lot of people feel that commitment to Christ and commitment to Christian service is a limitation, and it is a limitation on the way you live, but it's a limitation too costly to embrace. They don't want to embrace the limitations. They don't want to give up their Sundays. They don't want to give up a portion of their income. They don't want to give up certain practices of our culture and lifestyle that are forbidden for Christians. They don't want to do that. They'd rather be like everybody else, and so they reject that. They reject Christianity out of a fear that my life will be wasted, and even some Christians limit their commitment to Christ, even though they know the power of Christ and salvation and have felt his life-changing power, they still hold back and quench the Holy Spirit in their life because they fear that the sacrifices of faith will not be rewarded. I won't, it's not worth it, is their fear. 2 Timothy 1, verse 11 and 12, Paul approaches this when he says, For this reason I also suffer these things. <laughs> what things? He was in prison. He was in prison. Having been beaten, chained. His life incredibly limited in some ways. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, look at this, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. Paul said, I know that every sacrifice I make for him is recorded, written down, and will be rewarded. No sacrifice too great because it's all going to be rewarded. I'm not wasting my life. I'm investing my life in the kingdom work. We just had the privilege of visiting some of our church planters in the UK, and we've been privileged to visit them around the world. And they're not the only people serving God. Many of you are making commitments. Many great sacrifices are made here. But sometimes you can just identify a little quicker some of the sacrifices they're making. The sacrifices to be a long way from family, the sacrifices to be in a different culture, the sacrifice, and on and on. But being with them, you realize it's worth the sacrifice. And in fact, sometimes a little jealous of them because I know they're laying up rewards that I'm not laying up. And when we get to heaven, I have no doubt that when I stand in the line where Christ is passing out crowns for service, there's going to be a long line of missionaries in front of me before I ever get there because they're made sacrifices for the kingdom and a lot of other people making sacrifices. Think about you young people and see you at the pole. I admire you so much for standing up in a culture that sometimes, not always, but sometimes is not Christ-friendly, and standing in front of your peers and bowing your head and praying publicly on a, in, a, in a public setting. That is so admirable, isn't it? Can you give them a hand for what they do in that? When's the last time you did that? When's the last time you did that? When's the last time you called the entire company together and said, you guys be quiet a little bit, I just got to pray here. They do it. And I, but you know what? It's a sacrifice that is noted and will be rewarded. Christ sees it, it will be rewarded. He is able to keep that which I've committed unto him until that day, every sacrifice. So we're talking about fears. Let me go to a couple of action points, and I'll close this message. Three steps to overcoming fear. What can you do? If you're facing fear in your life, number one, use friendships to reduce fear. Fear is of the devil and of the night, and it dwells on solitude. The more alone you are, the more fearful you're going to be. Open your home, open your heart, open your mouth, Talk to someone about your fears. Share your heart. Share your life. There's power in friendship to reduce fear. Secondly, use action to attack your fear. I've learned this. Any action taken on any fear reduces its power immediately. When I'm trapped in the middle of the night by my fears, just getting up and writing down some action steps I can take toward that fear reduces its power immediately in my life. Even if it's just making a list of something I'm going to do. Take some kind of action toward your fear. You want to reduce your fear of heights? 
get on the London Eye. (laughs) Or something similar. Every time you take on your fear, it becomes less. And third, utilize faith, which is our great power to diminish fear. Memorize scriptures that deal with fear. I love Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. If you haven't memorized this one yet, you should. Write it down, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Isn't that a great passage? That's the one you can quote when you're in the midst of fear. I will not fear what man will do to me. And then under utilizing faith, remember past victories. You remember David when he was getting ready to take on the giant Goliath down in the valley, and he was this great, powerful warrior, and David's just this little shepherd boy, and he's getting ready to go fight. And David kept saying over and over, the God who delivered me from the lion, the God who delivered me from the bear, the same God will deliver me from this Philistine. He was rehearsing former victories. Have you had some victories where God came through for you? Have you had some times when God answered your prayer? Have you had some times when he taught, brought you to a struggle? Review, review and renew those victories in your heart when you're facing fear. And then the third thing is simply strengthen your walk with God. And you know what? And what I'm talking about is build your faith with God before you need it. Some of you been my privilege to walk with you through some terrible trials of your life and one of our dear saints was getting ready to deal with cancer she was been diagnosed with it and I just said to her I said you know this is a terrible thing it's difficult there's you know I grieve with you in it but there's one advantage you have over many people and that is you already have a strong powerful faith in God You have a strong walk with God because I know you. I've walked with you. I've seen you. You know how to pray. You know how to serve. You know how to walk with God. And you're not going to have to suddenly develop this faith with God to face this challenge. You already have a faith. You'd be surprised how many people, they got to get busy and, and scrounge up a faith for the trial. Don't wait for that. Deepen your walk with God today. Deepen your walk with God before the crisis comes. So you will handle fear better when the time comes. Let's stand to our feet with heads bowed and eyes closed. Hi, my name is Kim Beckham, and I'm the pastor of Central Baptist Church. Thanks for tuning in today and being a part of this worship service. I hope you found the message helpful and the worship inspiring. If you don't have a church home, please come check us out on a Sunday soon. If you should have any question about today's message or just want to talk about spiritual things in general, please check us out on our website and email us or call us at Central Baptist Church, 903-561-6361. So glad you are a part of the worship today. Come see us soon. God bless you.